Hi everyone, and thanks for attending my talk. Today, I'm talking about loading at hyperscale, or advanced data import techniques for CITUS. Um, first though, a little bit about myself. Um, hi, my name is Colton. I am a pre-acquisition CITUS employee, joined about a year before they were bought by Microsoft. And I spent three years working as a solutions engineer for CITUS. What this means is that I got to see a lot of implementations of CITUS in the real world. I worked with a lot of different startups. I'm pretty sure some of the people that I helped set up are uh, watching this now. Well, this is pre-recorded, but you get the idea. Um, and now I'm a Microsoft alumni. I've moved over to a company called TRM Labs, where I'm managing hundreds of terabytes of data in CITUS. TRM Labs is a blockchain intelligence company that builds infrastructure to prevent crypto fraud and financial crime. This enables people to transact safely and securely on the blockchain. Um, before I get started, I'm going to do a brief overview of the contents of this talk today. I'm going to start by just talking about the basics, you know, single row inserts versus copy, and for that matter, upserts, which are a wonderful Postgres pattern that should be used more often. Um, I'm going to go from there into micro-batched and parallelized copy operations. Um, and from there, we'll get into more difficult techniques. Uh, there's one I invented that I call index juggling that's worked out pretty well for me. I'm going to go into a case study on data ordering what and why it matters, distributed triggers and what they can do for you in large-scale data loads. And finally, the easily the hardest part of this talk, direct worker loading. So without further ado, here we go. Uh, first things first, whenever you're loading data into Postgres, you generally have three good options to do so. There is copy, there is insert statements, and there is an upsert. Um, for insert, for the record, I am lumping in delete operations as well to get rid of old data. Upserts do combine those into a single operation. The advantages of insert and delete um, methodologies is that well, the biggest one is that it handles bad data better. If you get a bad row in your input data and you need to change it or replace it and it causes an error of some sort, well, you've only lost one row, not a big deal. You can have application logic handle this or you can just log it and retry later. That's, that's fine. Uh, it is also extremely easy to enable. Most Postgres libraries will let you start this pattern within a few lines of code. If you're using an ORM, this is gonna most likely be your out of the box behavior for in most cases here. Uh, this is also fully real time, as in there's no waiting for anything to write. The moment you get the confirmation that it's written, it's in the database and permanent. And it gives you very granular timestamps. So if you have an uncreated date or something like that to automatically populate when your rows were entered, well, this works nicely for that. In practice, insert slash delete syntax can pretty reliably hit 10,000 rows a second without too much hassle. You can go beyond there, but you start to have to get fancy with tuning and with hardware specs and the like at that point. And this is pretty universal between Postgres and uh, Postgres with Citus. Um, for the upsert, uh, for those who don't know, upserts are where you use an on conflict clause in your uh, insert operation to you to take advantage of an existing primary key so that either you're inserting a new row or if the row already exists, you're doing something different. Maybe you're deleting it, maybe you're updating the existing row, maybe you're logging to a separate table, your call, you have all sorts of options here. Uh, the biggest disadvantages of this are one, it needs a primary key, obviously, uh, which doesn't fit every single schema. Sometimes there just isn't a good candidate for a primary key at all. Um, and two, it is of moderate complexity. This isn't always out of the box functionality for an ORM or something like that. You're fairly likely to need to at least have a little bit of handling logic for this. Uh, on the other hand though, this does have the same bad data handling and real time capabilities as an insert or delete operation. This can also reach about 10,000 rows a second, but keep in mind, uh, if you have an update heavy uh, update heavy configuration of some sort, this does combine insert and delete operations into a single wall log entry, which is actually a pretty big win. And in practice means maybe 40% faster for most of the use cases I've seen, but your mileage may vary. 
finally, though, we've got copy. Uh, copy is stupidly fast. Uh, Ten times faster is a good lower bound for how much faster it is. And I have seen production instances break 500,000 rows a second just using copy. This is awesome, but it has a couple downsides. One, the biggest one, and one that I'm sure most people here are familiar with, is bad data handling. If there's a single malformed line in the entire file you're trying to copy into Postgres, you're going to get a failure, and it's going to unwind everything you've done so far. This is not ideal. The other disadvantage is that uh, timestamps can get a little bit weird if you have on update or on insert clauses here. But if you're doing that sort of copy operation, this isn't usually a big deal for most use cases. Uh, going into a little more detail, we have a fourth option, which combines the best of both worlds in a lot of ways, of micro-batching your copy operations. This is where you combine, the exact number is hard to quantify, but I would generally say somewhere between 100 and 1,000 inserts, or somewhere between 3 to 10 seconds of activity into a single copy operation. Uh, once again, this is a highly variable number. I do some testing to see what works for you. Those should be decent enough starting points, but I've seen production instances smaller and larger on their copy operations. This lets you get the full speed benefits of copy, so you get these dramatically faster writes. This also seems to help with vacuum timing. I don't have any really good benchmarks on this, unfortunately, but I've seen a lot of anecdotal reports and reports and systems that I've set up of vacuum times getting much less painful once you start using this sort of copy operation here. Um, there's also the advantage of lower connection establishment overhead. So instead of opening one connection per row, you're opening one connection per every hundred or thousand rows or whatever, which definitely saves you some time. Postgres 14 makes this a lot less painful, but you still have network overhead to deal with, so it's well worth considering. This is, using this pattern, it's pretty easy to hit 100,000 inserts a second if you have enough hardware in your Citus cluster, and I've seen 1 million, but that was definitely a special case. So you might not be able to achieve that without some very careful tuning in a lot of hardware. As a side note, if you are using something like Kafka that will buffer your operations for you, this is really easy to set up. You just I believe there's even a mode for Kafka for this, but I'm not an expert in it offhand. Just buffer up your writes and write them in a single batch when you're ready. I think a couple ORMs will help you do this, but I don't know which one's offhand. Um, moving along, we have another relevant use case here of massively parallel copy. This is typically something you're going to either see if you're using Citus as more of a data lake or if you're loading a database for the first time. You're not usually going to use this for your everyday operations unless you have a very high churn rate in your data, but you might. That's a perfectly valid use case. Uh, this is mostly seen in those very large data load needs. Um, and all this really is, is you're splitting your source file into multiple chunks and doing multiple copy operations at the same time. That's all this involves. Excuse me. Uh, you do have to be careful here on a couple of different things. The biggest one is probably coordinator bottlenecking. The coordinator does need to compute a hash value of every single row as you insert it. And I'll be going into more detail on this later in my direct worker rights slides. So the coordinator can get CPU starved in this case. And sometimes when Postgres coordinator, well, excuse me, when Postgres instances are really short on CPU, you can get drop connections, which is bad because it resets your progress to some degree. I'd consider a thread count of roughly one thread per coordinator CPU core, not going above total worker CPU cores to be a pretty good place to be as a reasonable maximum. Once again, though, your mileage may vary. This does merit some further testing. On a side note, I would also recommend a few best practices here. One, split your files into chunks. Um, I usually quote a million rows here. It works pretty well. Uh, if, it, if that's too big or too small, that's not a hard and fast number. It's just a good rule of thumb here. That means that if you do have bad data somewhere in there, you have much less time spent replaying the same inserts when you try again after fixing the data. Uh, date range partitioning is also very helpful here, um, especially if you are writing directly to the individual partition. 
Um, you'll get most of the benefits of writing directly to an individual partition are Postgres 9 and earlier, so this might not be that big of a deal. Uh, if you're on a newer Postgres version, the date range partitioning's biggest advantage is going to be that your indexes fit in RAM better, so the update doesn't have to read your indexes for every different page. The technique that I mentioned earlier that I call index juggling is also very useful here. This is a technique I've developed for my own usage. It's being used in production here right now, and it's worked out well. In short, this is based on the concept that data loads are noticeably faster if indexes are disabled. If you're not writing the indexes well, you write the rows, and you only write the indexes when the rows are all in place, this can get two to three times faster in some cases. Um, it's pretty amazing. That being said, though, this definitely seems to work out better for most people when you aren't doing small updates of your data. If you're not updating at least 20% of the total table size, it's probably not going to work out too well. If you are doing a very large replace operation, then it's definitely worth considering and looking at here. If you are only targeting one partition, I would strongly recommend detaching the partition before you disable the indexes or remove them. This is specifically because of some unusual locking behavior I've seen in Citus around this. I've not pinned it down well enough to put in a bug. Hopefully I will. If I do, I'll edit this video to have a link to that when that does happen. Uh, I would also like to just mention some warnings that are reasonably obvious. Mostly this is not an online operation. So uh, if you can't afford the downtime of this, this is probably a bad call and is probably best reserved for initial data loads. You have two ways of accomplishing this index juggling. One of them is to just drop and recreate your indexes. The other is much more involved and is metadata surgery, but it has some advantages. So before I get into this metadata surgery topic, I want to give a very clear warning. Uh, this is dangerous. If you don't know what you're doing here, you can very easily cause silent data corruption, typically in the form of your primary keys not being enforced correctly, but there's all sorts of edge cases that I've barely seen. Um, so don't do this unless you understand what can go wrong and how to fix it. And whatever you do, don't forget the last step of re-indexing because otherwise your indexes are just eating up disk space and not being used for anything useful. Um, this is mostly going to be useful for if you're doing this relatively regularly and you don't want to have drop and create index statements littering your code. If you don't want your data ingest pipeline to have to know every detail of your schema at every time, this is very helpful for simplifying matters. I've got right here a code snippet of how to do this. Just to briefly explain what this is doing, we're using the run command on placements helper to tell Citus to apply this everywhere this table happens to live, whether it's a secondary placement or not. We've got our table name right here. And here we are using a simple update statement on PG index to update the IND is ready field. When this field is set to false, the index is considered not ready to be written to or read from. So uh, so whenever you insert a row, it is going to just ignore the index and not update the index to reflect the new row you've added. Um, and if you're querying it, it's obviously just not going to use this index at all because it doesn't believe it's valid at this point. And uh, the rest of this is just identifying it with the uh, rel ID, then doing a basic copy operation, then a basic re-index operation to get that index back online and fully functional. Um, with that being covered, let's move on. Uh, next is data ordering. This is a this is a topic that comes up sometimes. Um, it's not that often a problem, and this is mostly a function of data patterns, but it can be a very big problem if you're not looking out for it. Uh, in short, whenever you're loading data into Citus, we want to avoid sequential single shard updates. Um, so what this means is if you are if you have a CSV file of millions of rows and you've got your distribution key in there and it's organized so that first you start with one distribution key, you go for 100,000 rows, you move on to your next one and repeat, which is something that we often do see, um, then what's happening is Citus is going to be connecting to just one worker at any given time, writing the writing that chunk, pegging out the resources of that worker and leaving the other ones idle. 
and moving on to the next. This is not ideal. It works, but you're not using the full potential of your cluster, and it's going to be much slower than it has to be. Uh, this is typically something you're going to see if you have a lower cardinality of distribution keys, e.g. you've got maybe a few hundred unique values for your distribution keys, or you've got some noisy tenants, like maybe 20 customers that are 10 times the size of anyone else. That's typically where you're going to see this behavior. Uh, the way to tell if you are seeing this is to look at CPU memory and network and disk activity on the workers while you are doing a data load. If one of them is absolutely pegged on resources and the others are functionally idle, then you've most likely got this issue. If you are lucky enough to have Citus Enterprise or you happen to be on the Azure Managed Service for Citus, I would strongly suggest looking at the tenant isolation feature if this is relevant to you, but your mileage may vary there. That is a specialized tool that doesn't always fix everything in this particular case. To cover a brief case study with data ordering, uh, back when I was a solutions engineer for Citus, I was working with a customer who I will not name, who had a what we would call a multi-tenant use case. They had a few hundred small tenants, and I want to say six or seven very large tenants that were several orders of magnitude larger than anyone else on their platform. The way they were loading data was they had an internal tool that would connect to their existing systems, and it would generate a combined CSV file sequentially. It would start with tenant ID 1, then move on to tenant ID 2, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the behavior we were seeing was that they were trying to load their data. It was going slower than anyone expected. And when we looked a little bit more closely at the metrics, we saw that one worker would have maximum IO and CPU at any given time, and the others were idle. Uh, this let us figure out exactly what was happening with the data here. And what we ended up doing was we split this into a bunch of different CSVs, one per large tenant, and just copied them all in at once. Um, it worked out. Got the problem solved, got our loads sped up, and everyone was happy. Moving on to other advanced techniques. Distributed triggers are a not what people always think about when we talk about loading data into a Postgres database but they have a lot of capabilities that are very relevant to this here. They're typically something you're going to see when you've got a very complex operation. Maybe you've got business logic that needs to automatically run on new rows. Maybe you need complex audit logging for some regulatory reason. Who knows, there's lots of valid reasons for this. Um, in short, the big advantage of this is it lets you send one row and write five. This reduces the tra network traffic you are using to connect to the site as instance. And it also lets you use the CPU of your Citus cluster instead of pre-computing everything that you absolutely need to and setting up everything in advance. Uh, this can be a pretty big win in a lot of cases, so it's well worth considering if this matches. A good example use case of this would be, let's say we've got an order management system and we've got an orders table. And whenever we insert a row into the orders table, we want three different things to happen that we're going to set up triggers to handle. First, we're going to do an update on our inventory tracking tables so that we know that we just sold one widget. Next, we're going to do an update on our customer loyalty program tracking, where customer Joe Smith just went ahead and purchased something, and maybe it's time to send them a reward for being a loyal customer. Um, the third uh, sort of trigger that would be relevant here is our audit logs. We want to record, hey, we just sold this. We want to make it very clear when this happened. So we're just going to put it in there so we have an easy way of looking up everything. This is a pretty classic, if simplified, example of how this would work out. Um, if you are going to use distributed triggers, there are a few things to keep in mind for safety. Uh, the biggest one is probably around the logging use case. If you need your logs to survive rollback, then it's not going to work without using a foreign data wrapper or the PG Audit extension if you happen to be able to install that. That's probably the biggest gotcha that throws people off because unrelated tables that you wrote to in the transaction will be written to even if you use a function to do it, and then they will be rolled back if the transaction fails for some reason. So if you need to log what people tried to do rather than what they succeeded to do, a foreign data wrapper to the same database is a great way to work around this limitation in Postgres or, like I said, PG Audit. Uh, a technique that I've had some good luck with in the past that might suit you is to make a sort of fictional central table that uses instead of triggers. So when you copy rows or insert rows to that fictional table, 
your triggers fire, they ignore the result, they ignore the import into the actual table you tried to copy to, and they just update whatever other tables you wanted. This is typically something I've used where there's a lot of tables I want to update at once, but there isn't one table with a schema that contains everything I want. This has worked out pretty well in those cases too. Um, the, and a few gotchas. You can use triggers on reference tables to update distributed tables, and you can use triggers on reference tables to update other reference tables. I would very strongly recommend not using um, triggers on distributed tables that update reference tables. That's just going to end poorly. That's going to lead to some very complex uh, data discrepancies between everything. And unless you're extremely careful, it's going to cause you a whole world of pain and be very hard to troubleshoot. I do not recommend this at all. Um, I've got a link here and included in the resources at the end to an example of what a distributed trigger looks like in Citus. The Citus docs cover this one pretty well. It's just something that is underused rather than a real secret. Um, a few more things about uh, distributed triggers. Just in general, be careful with reference tables. They're pretty easy to mess with. If you're using a placement count of greater than one, um, and this is a complex topic worthy of its own talk, so just if you're using placement counts greater than one, you'll probably know, so you can ignore this if you don't know what this means. But if you're doing so, I have no idea what's going to happen with distributed triggers in some edge cases here. Be extra careful and test this thoroughly. Um, if you are adding workers, the triggers won't always automatically propagate to the new workers. In one or two cases in dev environments, I've set up a trigger on PG disk node to automatically create triggers on new workers whenever they're added. That might be overkill for your needs, but it is something to keep in mind either way. Um, and also, as I mentioned, you shouldn't have distributed tables update reference tables. It just ends poorly. Um, also, this is a very manual process. You know, I've mentioned using a lot of direct create trigger statements. So I'd recommend building some tooling around this, especially if you have a CI, CD sort of environment or otherwise need to recreate your database with some regularity just so you're consistent in your applications here. Uh, one last thought on this topic, I've included a link to a Citus issue where there's requests for better support for distributed triggers. Uh, if this is a use case relevant to you, please comment there so that the dev team knows how to prioritize their work. Um, Finally, though, let's move on to the final technique, the most difficult one, direct worker rights. Um, as some of us know, uh, every single worker in a Citus cluster is a fully valid Postgres instance in its own right. So you can connect and write directly to them in principle. Um, in practice, this is a complex problem, and it's probably not worth your time if you have less than 100 terabytes of data. It might not be worth your time if you have more, but it probably isn't if you have less. Uh, there are a few production users of this technique, but they are rare. Um, so it's not new ground, but it's certainly ground where you're going to have to do a lot of testing, and there isn't a lot of best practices to build on. And there aren't safeguards here that built in for you to use. You will need to develop some sort of sanity check. Uh, in a worst case scenario, if you write data to the wrong shard of a table, you're going to get wildly inconsistent results on some tables because Citus just doesn't know how to handle that sort of thing. Uh, it's not expected to. So make sure you have sanity checks if you're doing this and be extra careful that you've got everything inserted correctly. And uh, once again, to talk about reference tables, don't use this with reference tables. Just don't. Uh, it's not a good idea. Uh, as a final note of warnings here, this isn't currently possible to the best of my knowledge in the managed uh, services offering of hy hyperscale Citus on Azure. If this is something you need, you might want to reach out to the team and see what they can provide. I am not up to date with the roadmap there. So what does it mean to write directly to a worker? How does this work? How do we know where the data goes? Um, well, Citus has a shared nothing architecture, which is to say, in most cases, the data lives on precisely one worker, and it uses Postgres integer hashes to determine shard placement. Uh, Postgres integer hashes are their own topic worthy of another talk in their own right, 
But to be very brief, um, they use unsigned 32-bit integer bit shifting math to create a consistent, in theory, I believe, at least somewhat reproducible hash of arbitrary data. Um, to reproduce this, you've got a few different options. If you're using Python, I've had a lot of good luck with the bitwise operations in NumPy using their uint32 type. I have to be very careful with the type there. If you're using a regular integer, that does not get the same results because, well, Python doesn't like to give you unsigned integers unless you're very careful about requesting them. Um, if you're using C, that's really easy. I've linked the source code. You can probably just copy over the hash functions and use as you see fit. I believe the link I've included is to the text hash, but they're all fairly similar. If you're using Ruby, I haven't tested this myself, but you should in principle be able to use PAC with the L directive to get a compatible format to work with here, and it should be pretty straightforward from there. And if you're using JavaScript, I frankly have no idea. If you do get it working, please contact me. I'd love to know how to get this working in JavaScript. It would be pretty neat to see. Um, moving along, the one of the biggest gotchas that might not be obvious here is co-location group management. Um, in short, depending on how exactly your cluster was set up, not all integer hash ranges will go to the same workers. So what this means is, in Citus, we, there's this concept of co-location groups where some data is co-located to make your joins easier and avoid repartition joins. Um, these co-location groups are typically decided by the type of the column you're distributing by or uh, to some degree if you happen to specify a co-location group when you're creating a distributed table. If they're created at different times, in particular, these the hash range buckets that each shard has might not line up. So you might have um, in one table, you insert value one, um, which is hashed to let's call it two and lives on worker three. But in another table, because it's in a different co-location group, even though it is the same hash, it's on a completely different worker. This is a non-trivial complication in some cases, but this doesn't apply to everyone. If you have a single distribution key and everything is co-located, you probably don't need to worry about this. If you've got a lot of different um, distribution keys for different use cases or things like that, this is much more likely to be a headache for you. And if you've done any rebalancing, this is likely to also be a bit of a headache. Uh, I would suggest using the co-location ID column in PG disk partition to get a better picture for what how everything is set up and how this all lives. Just keep in mind, reference tables have their own internal co-location group. I believe it's always ID2, but I'm not certain on that. And you don't want to deal with that. You can just safely ignore that for the purposes of this topic. Another consideration with direct worker rights is shard placement. Um, so obviously, well, maybe not obviously. Rebalancing and the corresponding movement of shards is very dangerous when you're trying to write directly to the right shard. So if you're rebalancing at all, you're going to want to be careful here. I would suggest every single direct worker write starting with a query to the coordinator to figure out which worker to connect to, just for safety. Uh, it's the easiest way to prevent yourselves causing a very big issue because shards with extra illegal values that are supposed to be in a different shard are bad. This can, it's probably safe to say, severely break your database. I haven't seen this happen in practice, so I don't know exactly what it looks like, but I believe that at best you're going to have some very weird inconsistencies in your queries that are going to be a nightmare to pin down. Um, if you're looking to make this a little more simple with shard placement and also with the earlier collocation group topics, creating all your collocation groups at the same time and making sure your shard count is divisible by your number of workers should make life a little bit easier here. Citus uses round robin techniques to decide what lives where. So if everything is divisible, it'll place more consistently than otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, so that's it on direct worker rights. Uh, before I end though, a few useful tools that are relevant here. PG Loader, made by my friend Dimitri, who I believe is still at Microsoft. It's great, has some neat Citus features. You'll hit about a third the size of, uh, sorry, excuse me. You'll roughly reach one third the speed of copy operations with PG Loader in most practical cases I've seen, but it has 
really great handling for bad data or data where you need to do something fancy to get the right distribution key set up. So it's well worth using. Um, DSTAT, it's a standard open source tool that's available in any repository I can think of. It's just the best thing I've found for getting a picture of IO network and CPU load simultaneously on a given coordinator or worker. So if you host your own site as instances, I would recommend this over, say, top or free. Um, I've included a link to the lock monitoring wiki for Postgres. It's proved very useful on this. And I've also I used it to identify some very weird locking behavior on my workers directly. So don't forget to check those for locks. And of course, don't forget to look at PG stat activity on the workers. It's always useful to know what your worker thinks it's doing if something weird is happening. Um, one last brief note before we wrap things up. Um, we are hiring. If you are interested in making the blockchain safer, or if you're interested in working with hundreds of terabytes of data in Citus, then we could use the help. We are hiring. We would love to have you. Um, but anyways, in conclusion, Citus is awesome. Parallelism and copy are your friends, and you have a lot of great ways to make data imports work. I'm going to briefly share this resources slide. Uh, in theory, these are all going to be linked in the video description, but I'm just leaving this up for a few more seconds so people can copy them down in case something goes wrong with that process. And well, that's it. Uh, thanks for attending this talk. I hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to reach out to me and have a great day.